Good morning, everybody joining us from Asia and Europe, and good early, early, early morning to those joining us from North America. Uh, we are going to discuss uh, uh, water and what is the innovation perspective that is required when we look at the governance of water. And we have a very interesting and highly experienced panel. We have Vedika Bandarkar with uh, water.org. We have Ram Sevak, who has been working in northern India. Uh, Maxim Pasik, uh, who is an entrepreneur and developed new technology. And Jean-Pierre Seert, is that how you pronounce your name? Uh, who has been a water banker and works with water finance uh, facility. And we hope that Nicholas Parker will uh, uh, join us soon. Uh, when we talk about global water crisis, uh, uh, we are quite familiar with uh, what we mean by that. But I'll just summarize in a couple of minutes, and then I'll go to our panel to mainly focus on what are the possible solutions. But when we look at the crisis, there are three aspects of it. One is the shortage of water or access to water. There are almost 700 million people in the world who do not have easy access to clean water. So that's almost 10% of the world's population. So that is one level. The second is the quality of water or cleanliness of water. Because you might have water, but if it is not clean and if it is highly polluted, then uh, uh, it is not going to be very helpful. And uh, almost 2 million tons of uh, garbage is discharged in the water, uh, waste is discharged in the water every single day around the world. And as a result of that, you have a lot of waterborne disease. You have more than a million people dying of diarrhea alone every year. This year, a million people uh, died of COVID. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a big news every single second. But more than a million people have died of diarrhea, and we don't read about it uh, at all anywhere in the media. And the third aspect of the global water challenge is uh, the issue of transboundary water or shared water resources. Out of thousands of uh, rivers and lakes that exist in the world, there are 286 rivers which are shared by two or more countries. And 146 countries in the world have these kind of shared rivers. And they have their own problems because uh, of the competition between the riparian countries on the uh, flow of water that is there in the basin. So that's the broad picture. And obviously, in 45 minutes, we cannot aspect, uh, we cannot address every aspect of it. But we'll start with the first one, the whole issue of uh, uh, access to water. And let's start with uh, uh, Vedika Bandarkar, who has been working with uh, water.org and international uh, NGO. She was earlier managing director in India, and now she is a global impact officer with the organization. So Vedika, my question is, uh, what are the innovative ways to increase the access to water for the 700 million people uh, for whom water is not accessible? Thank you, Sandeep. Uh, it's a real, real pleasure to be here. And uh, I'm really glad you asked the question about access. Because uh, to us, you know, appropriate water governance has to include equitable uh, and inclusive access uh, to what, for water and sanitation uh, to everyone, regardless of their social economic status. Uh, as we know, many countries around the world really struggle with the large task of ensuring access uh, to the marginalized groups, uh, which are often excluded. So what we, water.org, have spent now more than a decade uh, doing is really developing uh, financial solutions uh, that enable households which would have previously dependent on uh, previously depended either on government aid or on pure charity to address their water and sanitation solutions uh, and their needs on their own. And as we know, uh, the you know the base of the economic pyramid is a highly uh, uh, it, it has many levels to it, and uh, ensuring affordable financing to people so that they can build their own water and sanitation solutions. We believe uh, this market-based solution allows the governments and allows the philanthropists to focus their efforts 
on the really destitute, on the most marginalized, who will need uh, pure philanthropic solutions. And, and, and hence this working together, the market-based solution, as well as uh, pure philanthropic solutions, we believe can help address uh, this massive challenge, as you said, of uh, the 700 people, million people lacking access today. Uh, additionally, I just want to make one more quick point, and which is uh, in, uh, and, and we do this work, by the way, across 13 countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And additionally, in recent years, uh, especially in Southeast Asia, we've also been working in close partnership uh, with the water service providers or utilities, uh, and again, uh, the host governments to help build the capacity of these utilities so that they can fund, uh, so that they can connect uh, households which they wouldn't have otherwise connected. So again, households uh, are living at the base of the economic pyramid so that they can expand their networks and improve delivery uh, to the low income households and communities. And happy to speak about this uh, more uh, during the conversation. Just, so thank just you. one quick question on the utilities and I want sure. to go to John Pair because they're, they're also working on the utilities. But when yes. you said you help the utilities to build their capacity, is it uh, financial capacity or is it technical capacity or what? Uh, what is that you're doing with them? Sure. So uh, we work with a wide range of utilities. Uh, so for example, in Indonesia, we work with uh, a lot with community-based organizations. Uh, these are the small utilities, both rural and urban. In Philippines, again, we work with both government-based, uh, small community-based utilities, as well as some uh, large private sector utilities. And in Cambodia, uh, again, with private community-based operators. So the nature of our assistance really uh, depends a little bit on the utility in question. But for uh, the community-based utilities, it's about uh, helping them uh, become more bankable so that uh, they don't have to rely on the government funding all the time. They can actually access domestic uh, commercial finance. And that help can take a lot of uh, uh, different uh, aspects. So it could mean just helping them uh, you know, start keeping proper records, uh, start uh, becoming more corporate-like. Uh, it can mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, offering assistance on things like reducing uh, revenue or uh, non-revenue water, for example, so more technical help. Uh, and we would take help from outside because we don't have that uh, cap capability. But it could also mean uh, providing some grid. So, for example, we found in Indonesia that uh, some of the domestic financial institutions required uh, somebody to stand as guarantor in the middle before they got confidence, they developed confidence in being able to lend to these utilities. So we did that too, and we used the grant funding which we uh, received to, and leveraged that to provide the guarantee so that the domestic financial institutions started lending uh, to these utilities. Thank you, uh, thank you, Vedika. And welcome, Nick. Uh, very early, very, very early morning in Toronto there, two o'clock, I, I guess. Uh, but John Pierre, let me let me take off from where where we were with Vedika. Uh, she she was talking about uh, uh, creating capacities for the water utilities, uh, and you are actually in the business of uh, uh, creating a financial market for the water utilities. So uh, how do you go about it, and how uh, what is the how do you look at the solutions? Thank you very much. And what we do is very much in line with what uh, Water.org does. Um, uh, let us take Kenya as an example. In Kenya, we see that many of the water companies have a shortage of money to invest in their infrastructure to give people the access to water and sanitation that they need. And we have selected 14 of them of about 100, um, uh, which we have helped in project development to develop the projects to give people the access and to become bankable um, because they were not before. And right now, and I just use this example because that is maybe better than uh, than speaking about it more abstract. Uh, with these water companies, we have developed projects. About a half million people can get access to it um, through it, um, and we finance it by taking the money from the local capital market uh, because we believe that. Uh, Water, which is uh, a domestic activity, is the best financed locally. 
Um, however, that is not so easy because, of course, the investors, pension funds, Kenyan pension funds, in this case, want to be sure they get their money back and they get a interest uh, um, on the money. Uh, so we also work with guarantees, uh, with CDI, USAID, DFC, and others, such that we can bring the bonds uh, to a level that is acceptable to the investors. Uh, this is not a new way of financing. Uh, the Dutch Water Bank uh, does this already for centuries. And I think uh, there's a small technical problem, I hope. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I think it says now it should be better. John Pierre, continue. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, so it's not a new way of financing, but it is a normal uh, way of financing if you go from, let's say, a low income country to a middle and to a high income country. And we love to support that and uh, especially making the water companies more bankable, uh, operationally better um, is something we, uh, we do. Um, and uh, we hope to be uh, successful in Kenya and then step to another country with this approach. And by the way, the team who does this has done this in many countries already. So is the money going from pension funds and investors directly to the utility or to a common fund in Kenya? Yeah, no, there is an in-between fund, let's say a trust, an SPC. Uh, and there you put the guarantee also. So you have to structure that in a, in a sensible way. And then it goes to the water companies. Okay, excellent. While we are on the issue of finance, let's go to Nick Parker. Nicholas, uh, best in Toronto, has been involved in climate finance for many years. And he's, in fact, inventor of the term Flintech uh, se several years ago. Uh, Nick, uh, just before you came, uh, Vedika explained that uh, they help the poor consumers of water, the direct consumers, final consumers, with microfinance. And uh, Jean-Pierre explained that uh, they organize uh, financial solutions at the level of utilities. Now, going beyond, uh, what are your prescriptions in uh, particularly financing the water needs uh, of the needy people? Well, first of all, it's great to be with everybody. And um, uh, even if it is 2 o'clock in the morning here in Toronto, 2 o'clock somewhere. Um, I guess I see the water uh, subject in within the context of uh, both secular and sustainability trends. So in terms of the bigger sustainability trends, we've seen a dramatic growth in investment, uh, in innovation, uh, in clean tech more broadly, but in, uh, in general in technology, but specifically in water. Uh, water, uh, relative to the size of the need and the size of the market, has underperformed in terms of attracting capital to innovation. But nevertheless, it is part of uh, what last year was $35 billion into clean tech innovation venture capital. And, uh, you know, a decade ago, it would have been about $10 billion worldwide. And a decade prior to that, it would have been about $1 billion. So we've seen a dramatic growth in innovation capital into sustainability. And even if it doesn't go into water, let's say it goes into energy or agriculture, often it has uh, many significant impacts. So now with cheap solar, you can pump water uh, remotely. Um, with um, uh, dry agriculture, you need less water, um, and so on. And the, the interesting thing about the rise of clean tech writ large is the not so much the technology, but the business models that are, have arisen. The second point that I want to sort of uh, surface, and then I'll tie the two together, is around um, what one might call embedded water. You know, we tend to focus on the utilities, but we don't focus on how much water it takes to make shampoo, coffee, a car, um, or what have you. And by looking inside the fence, we can actually reduce uh, the amount of water that's required in the first place and put a price on things and, and surface that and find out where we have competitive advantages and disadvantages. As the Israelis found out many years ago, it does not make sense to export uh, Jaffa oranges. 
Um, and similarly, we're going to find that in other places. So the way it all comes together for me, Sandeep, and, and fellow pal- panelists and audience, is that technology, both clean tech and more broader uh, technology like advanced um, like uh, uh, machine learning, um, can change the way, can change the economics, can change the empowerment, and can reduce the uh, need for capital expenditure in the first place, uh, uh, which is often very important uh, in countries with uh, tight budgets, and I can't think of one that doesn't have one now. So I, I think that uh, combining these things means one has to come up actually with new financing models uh, to take technology across borders. It requires um, uh, many other ingredients, but we're starting to see these things emerge, uh, sometimes learning from other sectors and sometimes just by force of innovation and sometimes failure. Um, and uh, failure happens, uh, uh, needs to happen faster in the water space. We need to innovate more quickly um, and we need to reduce the impediments, which are often regulatory and hence very similar to what one finds in other sectors like energy. Thank you, Nick. I want to come back to you with a couple of questions later. But since you are talking about technology, let's go to Maxim. And Maxim is in the middle of developing new technologies for supplying water. What are what are your thoughts on the on the technological solutions, Maxim? First of all, my pleasure to participate in such important event. And uh, you're absolutely right, addressing the issue of innovation and technology. Because without innovation and technology. We cannot solve uh, the biggest uh, problem of our generation, the shortage of the uh, clean, safe drinking water. And you are absolutely right. We are raising this three points, the shortage, excess, and quality. So we tried uh, to find a technology that is going to solve all the three. So actually, uh, Watergen uh, mission and the mission of Dr. Meirashvili, who is the president and the founder of the company, is uh, to solve the shortage of the clean, safe drinking water that every person in the earth uh, will have access to clean, safe drinking water. So what actually we are doing? Uh, we are converting the air to the clean, safe drinking water. Uh, we are doing it in a very, very efficient way. So it's taking a very small amount of energy. We produce great and tasty water. And uh, we have the machines that produce the water from 30 liters in your office when you're sitting right now. Uh, eliminating all the plastic bottles that you use to uh, 6,000 liters of water per day per machine. So one big machine can be enough for, uh, for the village. And uh, it's, point, it's, uh, it's solving the issue of excess because in a lot of areas uh, in the world, unfortunately, the groundwater is soiled or is polluted, so you cannot take any water from the ground. You don't have the pipes, so you either have the pipes, there are bad pipes, so you have a lot of lead and a lot of pollution in the pipe, so you cannot take the water, you can drink the water, and you have the shortage of the water because we are going to have another 2 billion people on the planet in 20 years. Now we have the shortage, so what's going to be in 20 years? So from where is going to come the new water? So actually what we are doing, we're providing this kind of solution, this kind of product that working on, uh, uh, on the grid electricity, on the solar power electricity, on the diesel, uh, whatever, any kind of electricity, you just plug it in, it drink. So it's it's very it's very simple solution. You can put it on your building, on the roof. What This is what we have, for example, in Israel, in our headquarters. We have our big machine on the roof. It's going to, we are making the parallel piping in the building. Very simple. And you have the clean, safe drinking water without zero solution, no dependence on the, any kind of infrastructure. So this kind of solution is good also for the developed and undeveloped countries because also in developed countries, the quality of the water that you mentioned uh, is very bad of the pie, in the pipes, and this is because of the infrastructure. You cannot change entire infrastructure in the world, but you can use uh, uh, the regular water, uh, what you have in the grid for uh, toilet or whatever, but you can take our water in order to drink. And lately, by the way, what is called innovation, uh, we put our technology in the, uh, in the uh, automotive industry. So hopefully in the near future, you are going to see the new vehicle that you don't need to bring all the plastic bottles to, to, to the vehicle in order to drink the water and to make damage for environment. The, the, the car, uh, the RV, the buses, the trains are going to make their own water with our devices on spot. 
So you just push the button and you have the clean, safe drinking water. And the beauty of this is very, very simple to, uh, to implement this. And our technology can work even in desert. Nobody can extract water in desert. But where, where does the water come from? Does it come from atmosphere or where does it come from? The water is coming from air. So actually how it's working in, in two words. <laughs> Uh, first of all, we, we, don't, we have unlimited air, okay? So if you will, going to add all the air that you have, it's much more water than all the rivers combined. So the machine is taking the, uh, the air to the, uh, to the machine. We are cleaning the air. It's very easy to clean the air. It's extremely complicated to clean the water. So since the air is clean inside the machine, uh, we are cooling the air uh, and extracting the water with our genius technology with very, very high efficiency and low consumption of the energy. After the water is extracted, we are cleaning the water, we are adding the minerals, and then, then you have the good water. So you have the good air because we take the bad air and convert it to the good air, and you have the good good and tasty water, mineral water that we provide you. And do you have it only in Israel or are you selling it internationally? We have, we are working in more than 60 countries in the world. Uh, and uh, we try to develop this technology much faster uh, and uh, uh, to integrate this technology much faster. And all the people, all the governments should understand that this technology, this is the game changer. This is the solution for the people because we don't have new water. This is new water from nowhere. And we are working with more than 60 geographies. We're implementing our technology in the buildings, in the governments, in the schools. Uh, imagine how we installed just recently a couple of machines in, uh, in Africa in the school. The kids were drinking very, very bad water. And in one day, they have great water. They don't, think, they don't need to worry for anything. You told that most of the disease is coming from the bad water. But we can solve it. Okay, great. Maxim, we'll come back to you. Let me go to Ravi Sevaknov. Uh, Ravi, why don't you tell us a little bit about your work? And uh, how do you look at, say, we discuss finance, we discuss technology. But how do you look at uh, holistic solutions in a country like India where you operate? Thank you so much, uh, Sandeep. Safe, affordable drinking water access for all is our mission at Safe Water Network. Our best in class field demonstration in India and Ghana in 400 communities managed by local communities themselves of safe water stations is the foundation of our work. We utilize innovative technologies as well as efficient finance utilization so that market-based principles of safe, affordable water make the overall program sustainable. India is today executing an ambitious $50 billion program to connect each home with functional tap water free of charge. And we are proud to say that we have developed this strategy for the ministry in 2018 for doing Hargar Jal or the tap in each home. However, sustainability of any of the decentralized safe water solution hinges on the local management. It also depends a lot on the innovations of digital payment, monitoring, training or analytical support and local field service entities. We empower the local women as well as semi-literate uh, youth to manage these systems. The world is plagued by frequent uh, water system failures, even if you install them. In this light, our 400 systems work 98% reliably 24 by 7 water access during the COVID lockdown as well. And over 1.6 or 7 million people utilize these services on a daily basis. And in this year, we saw double digit growth in volumes. The revolution in systems and processes has proven to be cost effective solution as well as for affordable, safe water delivery to the underserved worldwide. We are supported by Honeywell for feed demonstration as well as the technological uh, innovations. And USAID supports our sustainable enterprises for water and health or SEVA program for ever expanding urban settlements. 
In both these, we work on evidence-based policy, technology-enabled services, we do advisory, we do practices, which we expand further, we provide technical assistance to others, including to the world's largest uh, community-based water systems, 18,000 of these run by government of Karnataka. We are also very grateful to Horasis, which is a unique uh, platform for engaging the thought leaders to bring about the SDGs uh, quickly to this world. Essentially, we bring the knowledge of all these, implement it on the ground, and then disseminate and document everything that we have learned so that more and more people can get drinking water at earlier and affordable, managed by themselves. Thank you. Ravi, what are the what are the main challenges you see which are not being addressed right now and which for which the solutions are really urgently required? In fact, the biggest challenge is capacity building. You see, finance I have seen for the world, including the big cities of the world like New York, the government or taxpayer pays the complete uh, infrastructure. But sustainability uh, eludes all these systems. So two reasons. One, people do not participate in paying for these services. We are not asking for payment for water. We are also a nonprofit. But they should be willing to pay for the services so that they can be maintained and kept well. On the other hand, there has to be local competence and local management. If you do not have these, people from remote places cannot come to maintain any of the systems which Maxim or anybody has put up. That competency, capability and uh, the complete uh, ecosystem has to be developed locally. And for that, you need digital training tools so that you can make it available. Even during COVID times, why we were able to do it? Because everything was local. We could advise them uh, through remote monitoring. What are the issues? How to solve them through video conferencing? Or we knew every time what is happening in each of our uh, 330 stations in India. Thank you, Ravi. Yeah. Uh, Nicholas Parker, what do you see? major challenges uh, that are not being addressed adequately right now and that should be really prioritized well I, I you know I think we've already had a couple of examples of uh, entrepreneurial innovation and um, civil society innovation if I can call it that and I and I think there's a great deal going on at the grassroots that's uh, scalable and um, and replicable which is great I, I think the biggest, the bigger challenges um, and the claims on, on the resources are uh, with industry and, um, uh, and the embedded water that we don't realize we're using. You know, how many liters of water does it take to make a car? There's not a single citizen I can imagine who's not involved in the water industry who knows the answer to that. But if you're, if you're, the economic development minister or the environment minister, uh, she or he will have to make decisions about the use of water. And what concerns me is that water is being taken away from essential uh, citizens' needs uh, uh, and being used perhaps uh, inappropriately for economic development purposes that are short-sighted. Um, and uh, as a result, um, we will see, you know, socio-political conflict as a, as a consequence. So I, I don't think enough big enterprises are looking at how they can go dry, as it were, or how, to, how they can radically reduce the water consumption. And the technology, if it's not there, it, it's, it's going to be there soon. And then how... In the water sector, can we use the exponential technologies such as AI and so on um, to develop new business models? Uh, for example, in the renewable energy space, uh, in places like Cambodia, uh, we're looking at things like microgrid as a service, where there's local ownership and using AI um, and machine learning, we're able to lower the the cost of service provision to the end customer in a small village um, uh, very radically. 
and able to detect faults and problems earlier uh, so you get predictive and, and preventative maintenance. These kinds of things really matter at, on the ground because they reduce uh, the costs uh, dramatically. And it's all about cost if you're reaching the, uh, the bottom billion, as it were. Uh, thank you for bringing this issue of embedded water. I think that's really important. If you take uh, steel, for example, so if you require X amount of water to produce one ton of steel in the US, you require 3x in China and 10x in India. So it's a question of technology gap between the countries. So how do you try to meet that technology gap in different sectors? Well, uh, so this cup of coffee takes 150 liters of water if you take it through its entire life cycle. And I love this example because that's 150, you know, at least of what I'm drinking just to keep me on this call at 2 a.m. Uh, so I, I think part of the answer um, uh, has to be tech transfer uh, where appropriate. And I don't mean north-south in the traditional sort of colonial approaches. I, I'm thinking more south-south, just the innovations we're hearing out of India, let alone Israel. Um, and I think the, 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 the incumbents, the big players, the, 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 the utilities, have got to be much more open innovation platforms. It's very, very, very hard to bring innovation to big players and to break the the um, uh, the sales cycle and the adoption cycles. Um, Mekarot at one time in Israel, I don't know if it's tr true today, was a pioneer in being an open platform for innovation. So I think we've got to figure out how to get innovation from A to B and then how to once it's at B, how to, how to give it a chance uh, at a much more rapid uh, pace than what we're doing now. It's, it's too painful and too slow to break into the mainstream, uh, whether it's utilities or industries. Thank you. Uh, Jean-Pierre, uh, your work mostly is aimed at catering to the urban consumers, I presume. So how do you go beyond that uh, uh, in solving the water problem? Like, Nick mentioned the embedded water. Now, besides pure ensuring supply of water to uh, to the city dwellers, how do you solve the problem of uh, water need in agriculture, in uh, uh, services, in other sectors? How do you go beyond just the supply of water? Yeah, in, uh, indeed, Sandeep, we focus on um, on urban uh, water utilities because uh, they are the most bankable. Um, and the good thing about that is that if they get their money from commercial banks or pension funds, it frees up money for the government to go to the areas uh, where it is really needed um, and uh, where you cannot make a business case uh, for water. Um, uh, investments for companies and agriculture in water uh, are, of course, very well possible and happening a lot, um, especially in the industry. Uh, because it has a return on the investment. Uh, in agriculture, it is often way more difficult uh, because you also have to do uh, with a lot of uh, different local organizations. Uh, what, what I love to stress that is, uh, I really agree, of course, with Nick about, uh, about the importance of innovation, but also if you look at utilities or other organizations who provide water, there's still a big way to go to become really bankable to become really good operated companies. We've seen that the telecom industry and the energy industry um, was in a totally different shape 30 years ago, and they're totally professionalized now. And in fact, that is what you would like to do with the water sector also. As an example, if you go to INSEAD or Harvard or the London Business School, no one uh, is going to work later on in a water utility. That's a shame. We should change that. Uh, people who want to work in water utilities should go to these top business schools and take the knowledge with them and improve their companies. So I would love to make a plea for that also, that we all try to improve these water companies and that they become solid companies who deliver the services that they have to. You have an institute of water at Delft in the Netherlands. Don't they go and work in water utilities? Um, hardly also. And oh. Uh, you know, we have a technical institute in the Netherlands, EHI and uh, IRC, wonderful institutions, but you don't learn there to manage. You learn the technical aspects. 
as important as the other one, but there is still a gap there, which I would love that it would be bridged in the coming years. Coming to you, uh, Vedika again. So you said that your first uh, uh, sphere was the, the microfinance for the final consumer. Then you went to the next horizon, and that is the utilities. And mm -hmm. now what is your horizon, the one after that, in, in terms of your thinking and planning? Sure. So I, I, I first, uh, before I answer your question, Sandeep, I want to talk a little bit about microfinance, right? And, and so uh, it is our belief that one of the biggest barriers standing between people living in poverty and their own water or sanitation solution is the lack of upfront capital. And so what we have tried to do and what we continue to do is work with financial institutions, not just MFIs. It could be banks. It could be large self-help group organizations, microfinance, whoever has the channel to reach the last mile and convince them, nudge them that lending for water and sanitation is also a viable business. This is not charity. This is not CSR. It's a viable business. And to give you an idea of scale through this, we are working with our partners. We've been able to reach 30 million people across the 13 countries that we work in and have catalyzed almost two and a half billion dollars of commercial domestic finance, uh, domestic capital, which has been lent uh, uh, to, to the households uh, to build their water or sanitation need. And I think that journey is has been really uh, pleasing, but you know, there's still miles to go, right? We still have to convince more financial institutions who worry and they worry that, oh, a loan taken for water and sanitation does not sound like uh, it'll lead to income generation. So it must be bad lending and uh, or, or uh, such uh, doubts in their mind. And so that journey, we absolutely want to continue and to convince more and more financial institutions that in fact, this is good lending. And by the way, uh, the repayment rates pre-COVID have been close to 100% across cycles, and which is um, you know, an important lesson for all of us to remember that people living in poverty are actually good, uh, viable uh, borrowers. So that's, uh, that's uh, I, I didn't answer your question, but now I wanna come back to your question. And so when we were working with financial institutions and as we worked with financial institutions, we asked a simple question um, about five years ago and said, what will it take for you to continue to lend or even lend at a larger scale than before? What is stopping you from lending for water and sanitation? And some of them turned back and said, oh, if we had consistent access to capital, we would do much more. So that got us thinking and we uh, raised a fund uh, for the first time uh, within water.org, uh, a small fund, $11 million, really from friends and family. But then as we learned, we uh, spun this organization off. It's a separate uh, organization now called Water Equity, which is the first ever investment manager, impact investor, which is focused again on enabling, uh, you know, providing capital to enable access to water and sanitation for those living at the base of the economic pyramid. Water Equity now has about $60 million of assets under management. Uh, they've lent across four countries, India, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, and Cambodia. And they are in the process now of raising $150 million, uh, which they will deploy uh, globally uh, 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 for, for the same cause. And we've been very lucky. Water Equity has been very lucky. We've had uh, you know, investments from uh, investors like uh, DFC in the United States, uh, from Bank of America, uh, from Skull Foundation, et cetera. But, Again, through this, we are hoping to prove the case that investing in water equity, uh, sorry, investing in the water and sanitation space is a viable uh, investment proposition. And we're hoping that more and more investment managers, impact investors, uh, follow water equity. Uh, and, and because this, this issue is too big for just one organization, right? And we need more and more actors uh, coming in, uh, into this space. But your financial products, are they mostly uh, aim, uh, enabling the consumers to get water from the, by say, installing a tap or uh, installing a toilet and uh, sanitation facilities? Or can you also finance Maxim's uh, uh, machines? Uh, so somebody wants to buy them. That's a good question. So in the second fund of water equity, uh, we did take, uh, you know, 
most of that 50 million fund was towards financial institutions, but a small part of it actually was invested in enterprises, so debt capital. So we've invested in fecal sludge management enterprises, uh, water equity has uh, two of them. And after this uh, next fund, which I talked about as a global financial institution fund, the fund after that is going to be completely focused on enterprises, infrastructure, et cetera. So Maxim, yes, I will make sure water equity does speak to you. I, I think the only lens uh, it's important to say is our lens will always be, whether it's for water.org or water equity, our lens is always focusing on people living in poverty, uh, people that are marginalized, people living at the base of the economic pyramid, because uh, that is the strong belief of both of our organizations that we need to enable access uh, to those living in poverty. Thank you, Marika. Maxim, what's your next horizon? Say it again. Maxim, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Say it again, please. Yeah. What is your next horizon? Where do you go now next? Next. Uh, you know, we are doing so much in such short period of time uh, in a lot of countries and trying to help people. And I would like to give the, uh, let's say, the example and uh, the, the proposal uh, to our colleagues in India. You know, the World Bank investing hundreds of millions of dollars in water. But uh, at the end, it's going to the governments, and governments uh, don't spend uh, this amount of money efficiently, and at the end, it's not coming to the people. So why you, like a water.org, a very powerful organization, why you don't make the financing in order to provide the people access to clean drinking water immediately with the help of World Bank or any kind of organizations? Why people need to wait? We have the solution. We can bring the machines tomorrow. We're making, by, we are making, by the way, a lot of donations and a lot of charity because of Dr. Merilashvili vision. But, you know, we would like to bring those machines to more and more people, to more and more kids to drink the water. We, by the way, assisted in uh, the fluids in India. We sent our machines to Kerala, to different places for the people that they can have the access of clean, safe and drinking water. But I think that the world should do much more in order to invest in the products of the technologies, of the new technologies of new innovations, because, you know, the enterprises can do a lot, but in water, it's very, very complicated to do a lot in order to bring this uh, water. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Maxim. I'll just stop you there because we have two minutes and I want to give one minute each to Nick and Ravi to conclude. Where do you go next, uh, Nick? Where should we go next? Well, I'm thoroughly enjoying uh, this conversation, and it's too bad we've got to stop in two minutes. But I think from a financing standpoint, um, I, I, I love what we just heard about the uh, water equity vehicle. That's wonderful. Uh, but I still think we have a challenge that is specific to water, but it was also general to clean tech as a whole, which is uh, the gap between uh, innovation and infrastructure or development and deployment. So um, uh, I may be in a pension fund investing in water startups, but I'm not investing in water infrastructure. So I'm sub-optimizing returns, enhancing re risk, and, re and reducing my potential positive impact. So we are developing something we call SPICE, Systems-Based Investing in the Circular Economy. It's not just investing in circularity, it's investing with a circularity approach. So getting out of the siloed, um, linear, reductionist model that is all too common in, in, in our cultures and societies and coming up with a new approach that uh, liberates capital and makes it work much more effectively, uh, whether it's at the bottom of the pyramid or elsewhere. So that's the short version. Thank you. And now, Ravi. Yeah, I have 46 seconds. So two things, South-South yeah. cooperation, as he's suggesting, whatever lessons we have drawn with USAID support, take it to other countries. Number two, a lot of these infrastructures are put up without the monitoring or AI or predictive maintenance. We have developed systems which can be deployed at a very low cost with solar technology to monitor these systems. And once we are able to do that, we will be able to know optimal utilization of water. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a great fun having uh, all of you joining this uh, conversation. I hear from Horace that it will be on YouTube after two or, two or three days. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. I'd like bye. to see more. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Are you going to sleep with that coffee, Nick? Yes, sir. Are you going to sleep despite the coffee? Well, we'll see now. <laughs> <laughs> There's work to be done, so we'll see. <laughs> okay. I, I, I say it's coffee, but it may just be a prop. <laughs> <laughs> it it was a good point, though. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. It, it's been a pleasure speaking to all of yeah. you. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.